Section 6 of The Wind in the Rose Bush and Other Stories of the Supernatural. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roman Noble. RomanNoble.com. The Wind in the Rose Bush and Other Stories of the Supernatural by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman. The Vacant Lot. When it became generally known in Townsend Center that the Townsends were going to move to the city, there was great excitement and dismay. For the Townsends to move was about equivalent to the town's moving. The Townsend ancestors had founded the village a hundred years ago. The first Townsend had kept a wayside hostelry for man and beast, known as the Sign of the Leopard. The signboard on which the leopard was painted a bright blue was still extant, and predominantly so being nailed over the present Townsend's front door. This Townsend, by name David, kept the village store. There had been no tavern since the railroad was built through the Townsend Center in his father's day. Therefore, the family, being ousted by the march of progress from their chosen employment, took up with a general country store as being the next thing to a country tavern. The principal difference consisting in the fact that all the guests were transients, never requiring bedchambers, securing their rest on the tops of sugar and flour barrels and codfish boxes, and the refreshments from stray nibblings at the stock and trade, to the profitless deplenishment of raisins and loaf sugar and crackers and cheese. The fitting of the Townsends from the home of their ancestors was due to a sudden excess of wealth from the death of a relative and the desire of Mrs. Townsend to secure better advantages for her son George, 16 years old, in the way of education, and for her daughter Adriana, 10 years old, better matrimonial opportunities. However, this last inducement for leaving Townsend Center was not openly stated, only ingenuously surmised by the neighbors. Sarah Townsend don't think there's anybody in Townsend Center fit for her Adriana to marry, and she's going to take her to Boston and see if she can't pick up somebody there, they said. Then they wondered what Abel Lyons would do. He had been a humble suitor for Adriana for years, but her mother had not approved, and Adriana, who was dutiful, had repulsed him delicately and rather sadly. He was the only lover whom she had ever had, and she felt sorry and grateful. She was a plain, awkward girl and had a patient recognition of the fact. But her mother was ambitious, more so than her father, who was rather pugnaciously satisfied with what he had, and not easily disposed to change. However, he yielded to his wife and consented to sell out his business and purchase a house in Boston and move there. David Townsend was curiously unlike the line of ancestors from whom he had come. He had either retrograded or advanced, as one might look at it. His moral character was certainly better, but he had not the fiery spirit and eager grasp at advantage which had distinguished them. Indeed, the old Townsends, though prominent and respected as men of property and influence, had reputations not above suspicions. There was more than one dark whisper regarding them handed down from mother to son in the village. And especially was this true of the first Townsend, he who built the tavern bearing the sign of the blue leopard. His portrait, a hideous effort of contemporary art, hung in the guards of David Townsend's home. There was many a tale of wild roistering, if no worse, in that old roadhouse, and hide stakes, and quarreling in cups, and blows, and money gotten in evil fashion, and the matter hushed up with a high hand for inquirers by the imperious Townsends who terrorized everybody. David Townsend terrorized nobody. He had gotten his little competence from his store by honest methods, the exchanging of sterling goods and true weights for country produce and country shillings. He was sober and reliable with intense self-respect and a decided talent for the management of money. It was principally for this reason that he took great delight in his sudden wealth by legacy. He had thereby greater opportunities for the exercise of his native shrewdness in a bargain. This he evinced in his purchase of a house in Boston. One day in the spring, the old Townsend house was shut up. The blue leopard was taken carefully down from his lair over the front door. The family shuttles were loaded on the train, and the Townsends departed. It was a sad and eventful day for Townsend Center. A man from Bayer had rented the store. David had decided at the last not to sell, and the old familiars congregated in melancholy fashion and talked over the situation. An enormous pride over their departed townsmen became evident. 
they paraded him flaunting him like a banner in the eyes of the new men david is awful smart they said there won't nobody get the better of him in the city if he has lived in towns and center all his life he's got his eyes open know what he paid for his house in boston well sir that house cost twenty five thousand dollars and david he bought it for five yes sir he did must have been some out about it remarked the new man scowling over his counter he was beginning to feel his disparaging situation not an out sir david he made sure on't catch him gettin bit everything was in apple pie order hot and cold water and all and in one of the best locations of the city real high up street david he said the rent in that street was never under a thousand yes sir david he got a bargain five thousand dollars for a twenty five thousand dollar house some out about it growled the new man over the counter however as his fellow townsmen and allies stated there seemed to be no doubt about the desirableness of the city house which david townsend had purchased and the fact that he had secured it for an absurdly low price the whole family were at first suspicious it was ascertained that the house had cost a round sum of only a few years ago it was in perfect repair nothing whatever was amiss with plumbing furnace anything there was not even a soap factory within smelling distance as mrs townsend had vaguely surmised she was sure that she had heard of houses being undesirable for such reasons but there was no soap factory they all sniffed and peeked when the first rainfall came they looked at the ceiling confidently expecting to see dark spots where the leaks had commenced but there were none they were forced to confess that their suspicions were allayed that the house was perfect even overshadowed with the mystery of a lower price than it was worth that however was an additional perfection in the opinion of the townsends who had their share of new england thrift they had lived just one month in their new house and were happy although at times somewhat lonely for missing the society of townsend center when the trouble began the townsends although they lived in a fine house in a genteel almost fashionable part of the city were true to their antecedents and kept as they had been accustomed only one maid she was the daughter of a farmer on the outskirts of their native village was middle-aged and had lived with them for the last ten years one pleasant monday morning she rose early and did the family washing before breakfast which had been prepared by mrs townsend and adriana as was their habit on washing days the family were seated at the breakfast table in their basement dining room and this maid whose name was cordelia was hanging out the clothes in the vacant lot this vacant lot seemed a valuable one being on a quarter it was rather singular that it had not been built upon the townsend had wondered at it and agreed that they would have preferred their own house to be there they had however utilized it as far as possible with their innocent rural disregard of property rights in unoccupied land we might just as well hang out our washing in that vacant lot mrs townsend had told cordelia the first monday of their stay in the house our little yard ain't half big enough for all our clothes and it is sunnier there too so cordelia had hung out the wash there for four mondays and this was the fifth the breakfast was about half finished they had reached the buckwheat cakes when this maid came rushing into the dining room and stood regarding them speechless with a countenance indicative of the utmost horror she was deadly pale her hands sodden with soap suds hung twitching at her sides in the folds of her calico gown her very hair which was light and sparse seemed to bristle with fear all the townsends turned and looked at her david and george rose with half-defined ideas of burglars cordelia battles what is the matter cried miss townsend adriana gasped for breath and turned as white as the maid what is the matter repeated mrs townsend but the maid was unable to speak mrs townsend who could be peremptory sprang up ran to the frightened woman and shook her violently cordelia battles you speak said she and not stand there staring that way as if you were struck dumb what is the matter with you then cordelia spoke in a fainting voice there's somebody else hanging out clothes in the vacant lot she gasped and clutched at a chair for support who cried mrs townsend rousing to indignation for already she had assumed a proprietorship in the vacant lot is it the folks in the next house i like to know what right they have we are next to that vacant lot i i, I don't know who it is gasped cordelia why we've seen that girl next door go to mass every morning said mrs townsend she's got a fiery red head seems as if you might know her by this time cordelia 
It ain't that girl, gasped Cordelia. Then she added in a horror-stricken voice, I couldn't see who it was. They all stared. Why couldn't you see? demanded her mistress. Are you struck blind? No, ma'am. Then why couldn't you see? All I could see was... Cordelia hesitated with an expression of the utmost horror. Go on, said Mrs. Townsend impatiently. All I could see was the shadow of somebody, very slim, hanging out the clothes in... What? I could see the shadows of the things flapping on their line. You couldn't see the clothes? Only the shadow on the ground. What kind of clothes were they? Queer, replied Cordelia with a shudder. If I didn't know you so well, I should think you had been drinking, said Mrs. Townsend. Now, Cordelia battles. I'm going out in that vacant lot and see myself what you are talking about. I can't go, gasped the woman. With that, Mrs. Townsend and all the others, except Adriana, who remained to tremble with the maid, sallied forth into the vacant lot. They had to go out the area gate into the street to reach it. It was nothing unusual in the way of vacant lots. One large poplar tree, a relic of the old forest which had once flourished there, twinkled in one corner. For the rest, it was overgrown with coarse weeds and a few dusty flowers. The Townsend stood just inside the rude board fence which divided the lot from the street and stared with wonder and horror, for Cadelia had told the truth. They all saw what she had described. The shadow of an exceedingly slim woman moving along the ground with upstretched arms. The shadows of strange, nondescript garments flapping from a shadowy line. But when they looked up for the substance of the shadows, nothing was to be seen except the clear blue October air. My goodness, gasped Miss Townsend. Her face assumed a strange gathering of wrath in the midst of her terror. Suddenly she made a determined move forward, although her husband strove to hold her back. You let me be, said she. She moved forward. Then she recoiled and gave a loud shriek. The wet sheet flapped in my face, she cried. Take me away, take me away. Then she fainted. Between them they got her back to the house. It was awful, she moaned when she came to herself with the family all around her, where she lay on the dining room floor. Oh, David, what do you suppose it is? Nothing at all, replied David Townsend stoutly. He was remarkable for courage and staunch belief in actualities. He was now denying to himself that he had seen anything unusual. Oh, there was, moaned his wife. I saw something, said George in a sullen, boyish bass. The maid sobbed convulsively, and so did Adriana for sympathy. We won't talk any about it, said David. Here, Jane, you drink this hot tea. It will do you good. And Cordelia, you hang out the clothes in our own yard. George, you go and put up the line for her. The line is out there, said George, with a jerk of his shoulder. Are you afraid? No, I ain't, replied the boy resentfully, and went out with a pale face. After that, Cordelia hung the towns and wash in the yard of their own house, standing always with her back to the vacant lot. As for David Townsend, he spent a good deal of his time in the lot watching the shadows, but he came to no explanation, although he strove to satisfy himself with many. I guess the shadows come from the smoke from our chimneys, or else the poplar tree, he said. Why do the shadows come on Monday mornings and no other, demanded his wife. David was silent. Very soon, new mysteries arose. One day, Cordelia rang the dinner bell at their usual dinner hour, the same as in Townsend Center, high noon, and the family assembled. With amazement, Adriana looked at the dishes on the table. Why, that's queer, she said. What's queer? asked her mother. Cordelia stopped short as she was about setting a tumbler of water beside a plate, and the water slopped over. Why, said Adriana, her face paling, I thought there was boiled dinner. I smelt cabbage cooking. I knew there would something else come up, gasped Cordelia, leaning hard on the back of Adriana's chair. What do you mean? asked Mrs. Townsend sharply, but her face began to assume the shocked pallor which it was so easy nowadays for all their faces to assume at the mere suggestion of anything out of the common. I smelt cabbage cooking all the morning up in my room, Adriana said faintly, and here's codfish and potatoes for dinner. The Townsend all looked at one another. David rose with an exclamation and rushed out of the room. The others waited tremblingly. When he came back, his face was lowering. What did you, Mrs. Townsend asked hesitantly, there's some smell of cabbage out there, he admitted reluctantly. Then he looked at her with a challenge. 
It comes from the next house, he said. Blows over our house. Our house is higher. I don't care. You can never account for such things. Cordelia, said Miss Townsend, you go over to the next house and you ask if they've got cabbage for dinner. Cordelia switched out of the room. Her mouth set hard. She came back promptly. Says they never have cabbage, she announced with gloomy triumph and a conclusive glance at Mr. Townsend. Their girl was real sassy. Oh, father, let's move away. Let's sell the house, cried Adriana in a panic-stricken tone. If you think I'm going to sell a house that I got as cheap as this one because we smell cabbage in a vacant lot, you're mistaken, replied David firmly. It isn't the cabbage alone, said Mrs. Townsend. And a few shadows, added David. I'm tired of such nonsense. I thought you had more sense, Jane. One of the boys at school asked me if we lived in the house next to the vacant lot on Well Street and whistled when I said yes, remarked George. Let him whistle, said Mr. Townsend. After a few hours, the family stimulated by mr townsend's calm common sense agreed that it was exceedingly foolish to be disturbed by a mysterious odor of cabbage they even laughed at themselves i suppose we have got so nervous over those shadows hanging out clothes that we notice every little thing conceded mrs townsend you will find out some day that there is no more to be regarded than the cabbage said her husband you can't account for that wet sheet hitting my face said mrs townsend doubtfully you imagined it. I felt it. That afternoon, things went on as usual in the household until nearly four o'clock. Adriana went downtown to do some shopping. Mrs. Townsend sat sewing beside the bay window in her room, which was a front one in the third story. George had not got home. Mr. Townsend was writing a letter in the library. Cordelia was busy in the basement. The twilight, which was coming earlier and earlier every night, was beginning to gather when suddenly there was a loud crash which shook the house from its foundation. Even the dishes on the sideboard rattled and the glasses rang like bells. The pictures on the walls of Mrs. Townsend's room swung out from the walls. But that was not all. Every looking-glass in the house cracked it simultaneously, as nearly as they could judge from top to bottom, then shivered into fragments over the floors. Mrs. Townsend was too frightened to scream. She sat huddled in her chair, gasping for breath, her eyes rolling from side to side in an incredulous terror, turned toward the street. She saw a great black group of people crossing it just in front of the vacant lot. There was something inexpressibly strange and gloomy about this moving group. There was an effect of sweeping, wavings, and foldings of sable draperies and gleams of deadly white faces. Then they passed. She twisted her head to see, and they disappeared in the vacant lot. Mr. Townsend came hurrying into the room. He was pale and looked at once angry and alarmed. Did you fall, he asked inconsequently, as if his wife, who was small, could have produced such a manifestation by a fall. Oh, David, what is it? whispered Mrs. Townsend. Darned if I know, said David. Don't swear, it's too awful. Oh, and see the looking glass, David? I see it. The one over the library mantel is broken, too. Oh, is it is a sign of death. Cordelia's feet were heard as she staggered on the stairs. She almost fell into the room. She reeled over to Mr. Townsend and clutched his arm. He cast a sideways glance, half furious, half commiserating at her. Well, what is it all about? he asked. I don't know. What is it? Oh, what is it? The looking glass in the kitchen is broken, all over the floor. Oh, no. What is it? I don't know any more than you do. I didn't do it. Looking glass is broken is a sign of death in the house, said Cordelia. If it's me, I hope I'm ready, but I'd rather die than be so scared as I've been lately. Mr. Townsend shook himself loose and eyed the two trembling women with gathering resolution. Now look here, both of you, he said. This is nonsense. You'll die sure enough of fright if you keep on this way. I was a fool myself to be startled. Everything it is is an earthquake. Oh, David, gasped his wife, not much reassured. It is nothing but an earthquake, persisted Mr. Townsend. It acted just like that. Things are always broken on the walls, and the middle of the room isn't affected. I've read about it. Suddenly, Mrs. Townsend gave a loud shriek and pointed. How do you account for that, she cried. If it's in an earthquake... Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. She was on the verge of hysterics. Her husband held her firmly by the arm as his eyes followed the direction of her rigid pointing finger. Cordelia looked also her eyes seeming converged to a bright point of fear. 
On the floor in front of the broken looking glass lay a mass of black stuff in a gruesome long ridge. It's something you dropped there, almost shouted Mr. Townsend. It ain't. Oh. Mr. Townsend dropped his wife's arm and took one stride toward the object. It was a very long crepe veil. He lifted it, and it floated out from his arm as if imbued with electricity. It's yours, he said to his wife. Oh, David, I never had one. You know, oh, you know I shouldn't, unless you died. How came it there? I'm darned if I know, said David, regarding it. He was deadly pale, but still resentful rather than afraid. Don't hold it. Don't. i like to know what in thunder all this means, said David. He gave the thing an angry toss, and it fell on the floor in exactly the same long heap as before. Cordelia began to weep with racking sobs. Mrs. Townsend reached out and caught her husband's hand, clutching it hard with ice-cold fingers. What's got into this house, anyhow, he growled. You'll have to sell it. Oh, David, we can't live here. As for my selling a house I paid only five thousand for when it's worth twenty-five, for any such nonsense as this, I won't. Dave gave one stride toward the black veil, but it rose from the floor and moved away before him across the room at exactly the same height as if suspended from a woman's head. He pursued it, clutching vainly, all around the room. Then he swung himself on his heel with an exclamation, and the thing fell to the floor again in the long heap. Then were heard hurrying feet on the stairs, and Adriana burst into the room. She ran straight to her father and clutched his arm. She tried to speak, but she chattered unintelligibly. Her face was blue. Her father shook her violently. Adriana, do have more sense, he cried. Oh, David, how can you talk so? sobbed her mother. I can't help it. I'm mad, said he with emphasis. What has got into this house and you all, anyhow? What is it, Adriana, poor child? asked her mother. Only look what has happened here. It's an earthquake, said her father staunchly. Nothing to be afraid of. How do you account for that? said Mrs. Townsend in an awful voice, pointing to the veil. Adriana did not look. She was too engrossed with her own terrors. She began to speak in a breathless voice. I was coming by the vacant lot, she panted. And I, I had my new hat in a paper bag and a parcel of blue ribbon. And I saw a crowd, an awful, oh, a whole crowd of people with white faces as if they were dressed all in black. Where are they now? I don't know. Oh, Adriana sank, gasping feebly into a chair. Get her some water, David, sobbed her mother. David rushed with an impatient exclamation out of the room and returned with a glass of water which he held to his daughter's lips. Here, drink this, he said roughly. Oh, David, how can you speak so? sobbed his wife. I can't help it. I'm mad clean through, said David. Then there was a hard bound upstairs, and George entered. He was very white, but he grinned at them with an appearance of unconcern. Hello, he said in a shaking voice which he tried to control. What on earth's to pay in that vacant lot now? Well, what is it? demanded his father. Oh, nothing only. Well, there are lights over it exactly as if there was a house there just about where the windows would be. It looked as if you could walk right in. But when you look close, there are those old dried up weeds rattling away on the ground the same as ever. I looked at it and couldn't believe my eyes. A woman saw it too. She came along just as I did. She gave one look. Then she screeched and ran. I waited for someone else, but nobody came. Mr. Townsend rushed out of the room. I dare say it'll be gone when he gets there, began George. Then he stared around the room. What's to pay here, he cried. Oh, George, the whole house shook all at once, and all the looking glasses broke, wailed his mother, and Adriana and Cordelia joined. George whistled with pale lips. Then Mr. Townsend entered. Well, asked George, see anything? I don't want to talk, said his father. I've stood just about enough. We've got to sell out and go back to Townsend Center, cried his wife in a wild voice. Oh, David, say you'll go back. I won't go back for any such nonsense as this and sell a $25,000 house for 5000 said he firmly. But that very night his resolution was shaken. The whole family watched together in the dining room. They were all afraid to go to bed, that is, all except possibly Mr. Townsend. 
mrs townsend declared firmly that she for one would leave that awful house and go back to townsend center whether he came or not unless they all stayed together and watched and mr townsend yielded they chose the dining room for the reason that it was nearer the street should they wish to make their egress hurriedly and they took up their station around the dining table on which cordelia had placed a luncheon it looks exactly as if we were watching with a corpse she said in a horror-stricken whisper hold your tongue if you can't talk sense said mr townsend the dining room was very large finished in oak with a dark blue paper above the wainscoting the old sign of the tavern the blue leopard hung over the mantel shelf mr townsend had insisted on hanging it there he had a curious pride in it the family sat together until after midnight and nothing unusual happened mrs townsend began to nod mr townsend read the paper ostentatiously adriana and cordelia stared with roving eyes about the room then at each other as if comparing notes on terror georgia took a book which he studied furtively all at once adriana gave a startled exclamation and cordelia echoed her george whistled faintly mrs townsend awoke with a start and mr townsend's paper rattled to the floor look gasped adriana the sign of the blue leopard over the shelf glowed as if a lantern hung over it the radiance was thrown from above it grew brighter and brighter as they watched the blue leopard seemed to crouch and spring with life then the door into the front hall opened the outer door which had been carefully locked it squeaked and they all recognized it they sat staring mr townsend was as transfixed as the rest they heard the outer door shut then the door into the room swung open and slowly that awful black group of people which they had seen in the afternoon entered the townsends with one accord rose and huddled together in a far corner they all held to each other and stared the people their faces gleaming with the whiteness of death their black robes waving and folding crossed the room they were a trifle above mortal height or seemed so to the terrified eyes which saw them they reached the mantel shelf where the signboard hung then a black draped long arm was seen to rise and make a motion as if plying a knocker then the whole company passed out of sight as if through the wall and the room was as before mrs townsend was shaking in a nervous chill adriana was almost fainting cordelia was in hysterics david townsend stood glaring in a curious way at the sign of the blue leopard george stared at him with a look of terror there was something in his father's face which made him forget everything else at last he touched his arm timidly father he whispered david turned and regarded him with a look of rage and fury then his face cleared he passed his hand over his forehead good lord what did come to me he muttered you looked like that awful picture of old tom townsend in the garret in townsend center father whimpered the boy shuddering you should think i might look like most any old cuss after such darned work as this growled david but his face was white go and pour out some hot tea for your mother he ordered the boy sharply he himself shook cordelia violently stop such actions he shouted in her ears and shook her again ain't you a church member he demanded what be you afraid of you ain't done nothing wrong have ye then cordelia quoted scripture in a burst of sobs and laughter behold i was shapen in inequity and in sin did my mother conceive me she cried out if i ain't done wrong maybe them that's come before me did and when the evil one and the powers of darkness is abroad i'm liable i'm liable and she laughed loud and long and shrill if you don't hush up said david but still with that white terror and horror on his face i'll bundle you out in that vacant lot whether or no i mean it then cordelia was quiet after one wild roll of her eyes at him the color was returning to adriana's cheek her mother was drinking hot tea in spasmodic gulps it's after midnight she gasped and i don't believe they'll come again tonight do you david no i don't said david conclusively oh david we mustn't stay another night in this awful house we won't tomorrow we'll pack off bags and baggage to townsend center if it takes all the fire department to move us said david adriana smiled in the midst of her terror she thought of abel lyons the next day mr townsend went to the real estate agent who had sold him the house it's no use he said i can't stand it sell the house for what you can get 
I'll give it away rather than keep it. Then he added a few strong words as to his opinion of parties who sold him such an establishment. But the agent pleaded innocent for the most part. I'll own I suspected something wrong when the owner, who pledged me to secrecy as to his name, told me to sell that place for what I could get, and did not limit me. I had never heard anything, but I began to suspect something was wrong. Then I made a few inquiries and found out that there was a rumor in the neighborhood that there was something out of the usual about that vacant lot. I had wondered myself why it wasn't built upon. There was a story about its being undertaken once, and the contract made, and the contractor dying. Then another man took it, and one of the workmen was killed on his way to dig the cellar, and the other struck. I didn't pay much attention to it. I never believed much in that sort of thing, anyhow, and then, too, I couldn't find out that there had ever been anything wrong about the house itself, except as the people who had lived there were said to have seen and heard queer things in the vacant lot. So I thought you might be able to get along, especially as you didn't look like a man who was timid, and the house was such a bargain as I never handled before. But this you tell me is beyond belief. Do you know the names of the people who formerly owned the vacant lot? asked Mr. Townsend. I don't know for certain, replied the agent, for the original owners flourished long before your or my day. But I do know that the lot goes by the old name of the old Gaston lot. What's the matter? Are you ill? No, it is nothing, replied Mr. Townsend. Get what you can for the house. Perhaps another family might not be as troubled as we have been. I hope you are not going to leave the city, said the agent urbanely. I'm going back to Townsend Center as fast as steam can carry me after we get packed up and out of that cursed house, replied Mr. Townsend. He did not tell the agent nor any of his family what had caused him to start when told the name of the former owners of the lot. He remembered all at once the story of a ghastly murder which had taken place in the Blue Leopard. The victim's name was Gaston, and the murderer had never been discovered. End of Section 6 Section 7 of The Wind in the Rosebush and Other Stories of the Supernatural. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Claudia. The Wind in the Rosebush and Other Stories of the Supernatural by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman. The Lost Ghost. Mrs. John Emerson, sitting with her needlework beside the window, looked out and saw Mrs. Rhonda Meserve coming down the street and knew at once by the trend of her steps and the cant of her head that she meditated turning in at her gate. She also knew by a certain something about her general carriage, a thrusting forward of her neck, a bustling hitch of the shoulders, that she had important news. Rhonda Meserve always had the news as soon as the news was in being, and generally Mrs. John Emerson was the first to whom she imparted it. The two women had been friends ever since Mrs. Meserve had married Simon Meserve and come to the village to live. Mrs. Meserve was a pretty woman, moving with graceful flirts of ruffling skirts, her clear-cut, nervous face as delicately tinted as a shell, looked brightly from the plumy brim of a black hat at Mrs. Emerson in the window mrs emerson was glad to see her coming she returned the greeting with enthusiasm then rose hurriedly ran into the cold parlor and brought out one of the best rocking chairs she was just in time after drawing it up beside the opposite window to greet her friend at the door good afternoon said she i declare i'm real glad to see you i've been alone all day john went to the city this morning i thought of coming over to your house this afternoon but I couldn't bring my sewing very well. I am putting the ruffles on my new black dress skirt. Well, I didn't have a thing on hand except my crochet work, responded Mrs. Meserve, and I thought I'd just run over a few minutes. I'm real glad you did, repeated Mrs. Emerson. Take your things right off. Here, I'll put them on my bed in the bedroom. Take the rocking chair. Mrs. Meserve settled herself in the parlor rocking chair while Mrs. Emerson carried her shawl and hat into the little adjoining bedroom. When she returned, Mrs. Meserve was rocking peacefully and was already at work hooking blue wool in and out. That's real pretty, said Mrs. Emerson. Yes, I think it's pretty, replied Mrs. Meserve. I suppose it's for the church fair? Yes, I don't suppose it'll bring enough to pay for the worsted, let alone the work, but I suppose I've got to make something. 
How much did that one you made for the fair last year bring? Twenty-five cents. It's wicked, ain't it? I rather guess it is. It takes me a week every minute I can get to make one. I wish those that bought such things for twenty-five cents had to make them. Guess they'd sing another song. Well, I suppose I oughtn't to complain as long as it is for the Lord. But sometimes it does seem as if the Lord didn't get much out of it. Well, it's pretty work, said Mrs. Emerson, sitting down at the opposite window and taking up her dress skirt. Yes, it is real pretty work. I just love to crochet. The two women rocked and sewed and crocheted in silence for two or three minutes. They were both waiting. Mrs. Meserve waited for the other's curiosity to develop in order that her news might have, as it were, a befitting stage entrance. Mrs. Emerson waited for the news. Finally, she could wait no longer. "'Well, what's the news?' said she. "'Well, I don't know as there's anything very particular,' hedged the other woman, prolonging the situation. "'Yes, there is. You can't cheat me,' replied Mrs. Emerson. "'Now how do you know?' By the way you look. Mrs. Meserve laughed consciously and rather vainly. Well, Simon says my face is so expressive I can't hide anything more than five minutes no matter how hard I try, said she. Well, there is some news. Simon came home with it this noon. He heard it in South Dayton. He had some business over there this morning. The old sergeant place is let. Mrs. Emerson dropped her sewing and stared. You don't say so. Yes, it is. Who, too? Why, some folks from Boston that moved to South Dayton last year. They haven't been satisfied with the house they had there. It wasn't large enough. The man has got considerable property and can afford to live pretty well. He's got a wife and his unmarried sister in the family. The sister's got money, too. He does business in Boston, and it's just as easy to get to Boston from here as from South Dayton, so they're coming here. You know the old sergeant house is a splendid place. Yes, it is the handsomest house in town, but, oh, Simon said they told him about that, and he just laughed. Said he wasn't afraid, and neither was his wife and sister. Said he'd risk ghosts rather than little tucked-up sleeping rooms without any sun like they've had in the Dayton house. Said he'd risk seeing ghosts than risk being ghosts themselves. Simon said they said he was a great hand to joke. Oh, well, said Mrs. Emerson. It is a beautiful house, and maybe there isn't anything in those stories. It never seemed to me they came very straight anyway. I never took much stock in them. All I thought was, if his wife was nervous. Nothing in creation would hire me to go into a house that I'd ever heard a word against of that kind, declared Mrs. Meserve with emphasis. I wouldn't go into that house if they would give me the rent. I've seen enough haunted houses to last me as long as I live. Mrs. Emerson's face acquired the expression of a hunting hound. Have you? she asked in an intense whisper. Yes, I have. I don't want any more of it. Before you came here? Yes, before I was married, when I was quite a girl. Mrs. Meserve had not married young. Mrs. Emerson had mental calculations when she heard that. Did you really live in a house that was... she whispered fearfully. Mrs. Meserve nodded solemnly. Did you really ever see anything? Mrs. Meserve nodded. You didn't see anything that did you any harm. No, I didn't see anything that did me harm looking at it in one way, but it don't do anybody in this world any good to see things that haven't any business to be seen in it. You never get over it. There was a moment's silence. Mrs. Emerson's features seemed to sharpen. Well, of course I don't want to urge you, said she, if you don't feel like talking about it. But maybe it might do you good to tell it out, if it's on your mind worrying you. I try to put it out of my mind, said Mrs. Meserve. Well, it's just as you feel. I never told anybody but Simon, said Mrs. Meserve. I never felt as if it was wise, perhaps. I didn't know what folks might think. So many don't believe in anything they can't understand that they might think my mind wasn't right. Simon advised me not to talk about it. He said he didn't believe it was anything supernatural, but he had to own up that he couldn't give any explanation for it to save his life. He had to own up that he didn't believe anybody could. Then he said he wouldn't talk about it. He said lots of folks would sooner tell folks my head wasn't right than to own up they couldn't see through it. I'm sure I wouldn't say so, 
returned Mrs. Emerson reproachfully. You know better than that, I hope. Yes, I do, replied Mrs. Meserve. I know you wouldn't say so. And I wouldn't tell it to his soul if you didn't want me to. Well, I'd rather you wouldn't. I won't speak of it even to Mr. Emerson. I'd rather you wouldn't even to him. I won't. Mrs. Emerson took up her dress skirt again. Mrs. Meserve hooked up another loop of blue wool. Then she began. Of course, said she, I ain't going to say positively that I believe or disbelieve in ghosts, but all I tell you is what I saw. I can't explain it. I don't pretend I can, for I can't. If you can, well and good. I shall be glad, for it will stop tormenting me as it has done and always will otherwise. There hasn't been a day nor a night since it happened that I haven't thought of it, and always I have felt the shivers go down my back when I did. That's an awful feeling, Mrs. Emerson said. Ain't it? Well, it happened before I was married, when I was a girl and lived in East Wilmington. It was the first year I lived there. You know my family all died five years before that, I told you. Mrs. Emerson nodded. Well, I went there to teach school, and I went to board with Mrs. Amelia Dennison and her sister, Mrs. Bird. Abby, her name was, Abby Bird. She was a widow. She had never had any children. She had a little money. Mrs. Dennison didn't have any. And she had come to East Wilmington and bought the house they lived in. It was a real pretty house, though it was very old and run down. It had cost Mrs. Bird a good deal to put it in order. I guess that was the reason they took me to board. I guess they thought it would help along a little. I guess what I paid for my board about kept us all in vittles. Mrs. Bird had enough to live on if they were careful, but she had spent so much fixing up the old house that they must have been a little pinched for a while. Anyhow, they took me to board, and I thought I was pretty lucky to get in there. I had a nice room, big and sunny and furnished pretty, the paper and paint all new, and everything as neat as wax. Mrs. Dennison was one of the best cooks I ever saw, and I had a little stove in my room, and there was always a nice fire there when I got home from school. I thought I hadn't been in such a nice place since I lost my own home until I had been there about three weeks. I had been there about three weeks before I found it out, though I guess it had been going on ever since they had been in the house, and that was most four months. They hadn't said anything about it, and I didn't wonder, for there they had just bought the house and been to so much expense and trouble fixing it up. Well, I went there in September. I began my school the first Monday. I remember it was a real cold fall, and there was a frost in the middle of September, and I had to put on my winter coat. I remember when I came home that night, let me see, I began school on a Monday, and that was two weeks from the next Thursday. I took off my coat downstairs and laid it on the table in the front entry. It was a real nice coat, heavy black broadcloth trimmed with fur. I had had it the winter before. Mrs. Bird called after me as I went upstairs that I ought not to leave it in the front entry for fear someone might come in and take it, but I only laughed and called back to her that I wasn't afraid. I never was much afraid of burglars. Well, though it was hardly the middle of September, it was a real cold night. I remember my room faced west, and the sun was getting low, and the sky was a pale yellow and purple, just as you see it sometimes in the winter when there is going to be a cold snap. I rather think that was the night the frost came the first time. I know Mrs. Dennison covered up some flowers she had in the front yard, anyhow. I remember looking out and seeing an old green plaid shawl of hers over the verbena bed, there was a fire in my little wood stove. Mrs. Bird made it, I know. She was a real motherly sort of woman. She always seemed to be happiest when she was doing something to make other folks happy and comfortable. Mrs. Dennison told me she had always been so. She said she had coddled her husband within an inch of his life. It's lucky Abby never had any children, she said, for she would have spoiled them. Well, that night I sat down beside my nice little fire and ate an apple. There was a plate of nice apples on my table. Mrs. Bird put them there. I was always very fond of apples. Well, I sat down and ate an apple and was having a beautiful time and thinking how lucky I was to have got bored in such a place with such nice folks when I heard a queer little sound at my door. It was such a little hesitating sort of sound that it sounded more like a fumble than a knock, as if someone very timid with very little hands was feeling along the door, not quite daring to knock. For a minute I thought it was a mouse, but I waited and it came again, and then I made up my mind it was a knock, but a very little scared one, 
So I said, come in, but nobody came in, and then presently I heard the knock again. Then I got up and opened the door, thinking it was very queer, and I had a frightened feeling without knowing why. Well, I opened the door, and the first thing I noticed was a draft of cold air as if the front door downstairs was open, but there was a strange close smell about the cold draft. It smelled more like a cellar that had been shut up for years than out of doors. Then I saw something. I saw my coat first. The thing that held it was so small that I couldn't see much of anything else. Then I saw a little white face with eyes so scared and wishful that they seemed as if they might eat a hole in anybody's heart. It was a dreadful little face, with something about it which made it different from any other face on earth, but it was so pitiful that somehow it did away a good deal with the dreadfulness, and there were two little hands spotted purple with cold, holding up my winter coat, and a strange little faraway voice said, I can't find my mother. For heaven's sake, I said, who are you? Then the little voice said again, I can't find my mother. All the time I could smell the cold and I saw that it was about the child. The cold was clinging to her as if she had come out of some deadly cold place. Well, I took my coat, and I didn't know what else to do, and the cold was clinging to that. It was as cold as if it had come off ice. When I had the coat, I could see the child more plainly. She was dressed in one little white garment made very simply. It was a nightgown, only very long, quite covering her feet, and I could see dimly through it her little thin body mottled purple with cold. Her face did not look so cold. That was a clear waxen white. Her hair was dark, but it looked as if it might be dark only because it was so damp, almost wet, and might really be light hair. It clung very close to her forehead, which was round and white. She would have been very beautiful if she had not been so dreadful. Who are you? says I again, looking at her. She looked at me with her terrible pleading eyes and did not say anything. What are you? says I. Then she went away. She did not seem to run or walk like other children. She flitted like one of those little filmy white butterflies that don't seem like real ones. They are so light and move as if they had no weight. But she looked back from the head of the stairs. I can't find my mother, said she, and I never heard such a voice. Who is your mother, says I, but she was gone. Well, I thought for a moment I should faint away. The room got dark and I heard a singing in my ears. Then I flung my coat onto the bed. My hands were as cold as ice from holding it, and I stood in my door and called first Mrs. Bird and then Mrs. Dennison. I didn't dare go down over the stairs where that had gone. It seemed to me I should go mad if I didn't see somebody or something like other folks on the face of the earth. I thought I should never make anybody hear, but I could hear them stepping about downstairs and I could smell biscuits bacon for supper. Somehow the smell of those biscuits seemed the only natural thing left to keep me in my right mind. I didn't dare go over those stairs. I just stood there and called, and finally I heard the entry door open and Mrs. Bird called back. What is it? Did you call, Miss Arms? Come up here. Come up here as quick as you can, both of you. I screamed out. Quick, quick, quick. I heard Mrs. Bird tell Mrs. Dennison, Come quick, Amelia. Something is the matter in Miss Arms' room. It struck me even then that she had expressed herself rather queerly, and it struck me as very queer indeed when they both got upstairs and I saw that they knew what had happened, or that they knew of what nature that happening was. "'What is it, dear?' asked Mrs. Bird, and her pretty, loving voice had a strange sound. I saw her look at Mrs. Dennison, and I saw Mrs. Dennison look back at her. "'For God's sake,' says I, and I had never spoken so before, "'for God's sake, what was it brought my coat upstairs?' "'What was it like?' asked Mrs. Dennison in a sort of failing voice, and she looked at her sister again, and her sister looked back at her. "'It was a child I had never seen here before. It looked like a child,' says I, "'but I never saw a child so dreadful, and it had on a nightgown and said she couldn't find her mother. Who was it? What was it?' I thought for a minute Mrs. Dennison was going to faint, but Mrs. Bird hung on to her and rubbed her hands and whispered in her ear. She had the cooingest kind of voice." and I ran and got her a glass of water. I tell you, it took considerable courage to go downstairs alone, but they had set a lamp on every table so I could see. I don't believe I could have spunked up enough to go downstairs in the dark, thinking every second that child might be close to me. The lamp and the smell of the biscuits baking seemed to sort of keep my courage up, but I tell you, I didn't waste much time going down those stairs and out in the kitchen for a glass of water. I pumped as if the house was a fire, and I grabbed the first thing I came across in the shape of a tumbler. It was a painted one that Mrs. Dennison's Sunday school class gave her, and it was meant for a flower vase. 
Well, I filled it and then ran upstairs. I felt every minute as if something would catch my feet, and I held the glass to Mrs. Dennison's lips while Mrs. Bird held her head up, and she took a good long swallow. Then she looked hard at the tumbler. Yes, says I, I know I got this one, but I took the first I came across, and it isn't hurt a mite. Don't get the painted flowers wet, says Mrs. Dennison very feebly. They'll wash off if you do. I'll be real careful, says I. I knew she set a sight by that painted tumbler. The water seemed to do Mrs. Dennison good, for presently she pushed Mrs. Bird away and sat up. She had been laying down on my bed. I'm all over it now, says she, but she was terribly white, and her eyes looked as if they saw something outside things. Mrs. Bird wasn't much better, but she always had a sort of settled, sweet, good look that nothing could disturb to any great extent. I knew I looked dreadful, for I caught a glimpse of myself in the glass, and I would hardly have known who it was. Mrs. Dennison, she slid off the bed and walked sort of tottery to a chair. I was silly to give way so, says she. No, you wasn't silly, sister, said Mrs. Bird. I don't know what this means any more than you do, but whatever it is, no one ought to be called silly for being overcome by anything so different from other things which we have known all our lives. Mrs. Dennison looked at her sister, then she looked at me, then back at her sister again, and Mrs. Bird spoke as if she had been asked a question. Yes, says she, I do think Miss Arms ought to be told. That is, I think she ought to be told all we know ourselves. That isn't much, said Mrs. Dennison, with a dying away sort of sigh. She looked as if she might faint away again any minute. She was a real delicate looking woman, but it turned out she was a good deal stronger than poor Mrs. Bird. No, there isn't much we do know, says Mrs. Bird, but what little there is she ought to know. I felt as if she ought to know when she first came here. Well, I didn't feel quite right about it, said Mrs. Dennison, but I kept hoping it might stop, and anyway, that it might never trouble her, and you had put so much into the house, and we needed the money, and I didn't know, but she might be nervous and think she shouldn't come, and I didn't want to take a man boarder. And aside from the money, we are very anxious to have you come, my dear, said Mrs. Bird. Yes, said Mrs. Dennison, we wanted the young company in the house. We were lonesome, and we both of us took a great liking to you the minute we set eyes on you. And I guess they meant what they said, both of them. They were beautiful women, and nobody could be any kinder to me than they were, and I never blamed them for not telling me before, and as they said, there wasn't really much to tell. They hadn't any sooner fairly bought the house and moved into it than they began to see and hear things. Mrs. Bird said they were sitting together in the sitting room one evening when they heard it the first time. She said her sister was knitting lace. Mrs. Dennison made beautiful knitted lace, and she was reading the Missionary Herald. Mrs. Bird was very much interested in mission work, when all of a sudden they heard something. She heard it first, and she laid down her missionary herald and listened. And then Mrs. Dennison, she saw her listening, and she dropped her lace. What is it you are listening to, Abby? says she. Then it came again, and they both heard, and the cold shivers went down their back to hear it, though they didn't know why. It's the cat, isn't it? says Mrs. Bird. It isn't any cat, says Mrs. Dennison. Oh, I guess it must be the cat. Maybe she's got a mouse, says Mrs. Bird, real cheerful to calm down Mrs. Dennison, for she saw she was most scared to death, and she was always afraid of her fainting away. Then she opens the door and calls, Kitty, Kitty, Kitty. They had brought their cat with them in a basket when they came to East Wilmington to live. It was a real handsome tiger cat, a Tommy, and he knew a lot. Well, she called Kitty, 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 and sure enough, the kitty came, and when he came in the door, he gave a big yowl that didn't sound unlike what they had heard. There, sister, here it is. You see, it was the cat, says Mrs. Bird. Poor kitty. But Mrs. Dennison, she eyed the cat, and she gave a great screech. What's that? What's that? says she. What's what? says Mrs. Bird, pretending to herself that she didn't see what her sister meant. Something's got a hold of the cat's tail, said Mrs. Dennison. Something's got a hold of his tail. It's pulled straight out, and he can't get away. Just hear him yowl. It isn't anything, says Mrs. Bird, but even as she said that, she could see a little hand holding fast to the cat's tail, and then the child seemed to sort of clear out of the dimness behind the hand, and the child was sort of laughing then, instead of looking sad, and she said that was a great deal worse. She said that laugh was the most awful and the saddest thing she ever heard. Well, she was so dumbfounded that she didn't know what to do, and she couldn't sense at first that it was anything supernatural. She thought it might be one of the neighbor's children who had run away and was making free of their house and was teasing their cat, and that they must be just nervous to feel so upset by it. So she speaks up sort of sharp. Don't you know that you mustn't pull the kitty's tail, says she? 
Don't you know you hurt the poor kitty, and she'll scratch you if you don't take care? Poor kitty, you mustn't hurt her. And with that, she said the child stopped pulling on the cat's tail and went to stroking her just as soft and pitiful, and the cat put his back up and rubbed and purred as if he liked it. The cat never seemed a mite afraid, and that seemed queer, for I had always heard that animals were dreadfully afraid of ghosts. But then, that was a pretty harmless little sort of ghost. Well, Mrs. Bird said the child stroked the cat while she and Mrs. Dennison stood watching it and holding on to each other, for no matter how hard they tried to think it was all right, it didn't look right. Finally, Mrs. Dennison, she spoke. What's your name, little girl, says she. Then the child looks up and stops stroking the cat and says she can't find her mother, just the way she said it to me. Then Mrs. Dennison gave such a gasp that Mrs. Bird thought she was going to faint away, but she didn't. Well, who is your mother? says she. But the child just says again, I can't find my mother. I can't find my mother. Where do you live, dear? says Mrs. Bird. I can't find my mother, says the child. Well, that was the way it was. Nothing happened. Those two women stood there hanging on to each other, and the child stood in front of them, and they asked her questions, and everything she would say was, I can't find my mother. Then Mrs. Bird tried to catch hold of the child, for she thought in spite of what she saw that perhaps she was nervous and it was a real child, only perhaps not quite right in its head, that had run away in her little nightgown after she had been put to bed. She tried to catch the child. She had an idea of putting a shawl around it and going out, and she was a little thing she could have carried here easy enough, and trying to find out which of the neighbors she belonged. But the minute she moved toward the child, there wasn't any child there. There was only that little voice seeming to come from nothing, saying, I can't find my mother, and presently that died away. Well, the same thing kept happening, or something very much the same. Once in a while, Mrs. Bird would be washing dishes, and all at once the child would be standing beside her with the dish towel wiping them. Of course, that was terrible. Mrs. Bird would wash the dishes all over. Sometimes she didn't tell Mrs. Dennison it made her so nervous. Sometimes when they were making cake, they would find the raisins all picked over, and sometimes little sticks of kindling wood would be found laying beside the kitchen stove. They never knew when they would come across the child, and always she kept saying over and over that she couldn't find her mother. They never tried talking to her, except once in a while Mrs. Bird would get desperate and ask her something, but the child never seemed to hear it. She always kept right on saying that she couldn't find her mother. After they told me all they had to tell about their experience with the child, they told me about the house and the people that lived there before they did. It seemed something dreadful had happened in that house, and the land agent had never let on to them. I don't think they would have bought it if he had, no matter how cheap it was, for even if folks aren't really afraid of anything, they don't want to live in houses where such dreadful things have happened that you keep thinking about them. I know after they told me I should have never stayed there another night if I hadn't thought so much of them, no matter how comfortable I was made. I was never nervous either, but I stayed. Of course it didn't happen in my room. If it had, I could not have stayed. What was it? asked Mrs. Emerson in an odd voice. It was an awful thing. The child had lived in the house with her father and mother two years before. They had come, or the father had, from a real good family. He had a good situation. He was a drummer for a big leather house in the city, and they lived real pretty with plenty to do with. But the mother was a real wicked woman. She was as handsome as a picture, and they said she came from good sort of people enough in Boston, but she was bad clean through, though she was real pretty spoken and most everybody liked her. She used to dress out and make a great show, and she never seemed to take much interest in the child, and folks began to say she wasn't treated right. The woman had a hard time keeping a girl, for some reason one wouldn't say. They would leave and then talk about her awfully, telling all kinds of things. People didn't believe it at first, then they began to. They said that the woman made that little thing, though she wasn't much over five years old and small and babyish for her age, do most of the work, what there was done. They said the house used to look like a pigsty when she didn't have help. They said the little thing used to stand on a chair and wash dishes, and they'd seen her carrying sticks of wood most as big as she was many a time, and they'd heard her mother scolding her. The woman was a fine singer and had a voice like a screech owl when she scolded. The father was away most of the time, and when that happened, he had been away out west for some weeks. There had been a married man hanging about the mother for some time, and folks had talked some. But they weren't sure there was anything wrong, and he was a man very high up, with money. So they kept pretty still for fear he would hear of it and make trouble for them. And of course nobody was sure, 
though folks did say afterward that the father of the child had ought to have been told but that wasn't very easy to say it wouldn't have been so easy to find anybody who would have been willing to tell him such a thing especially when they weren't any too sure he set his eyes by his wife too they said all he seemed to think of was ways to earn money to buy things to deck her out in and he about worshipped the child too they said he was a real nice man the men that are treated so bad mostly are real nice men i've always noticed that well one morning that man that there had been whispers about was missing he had been gone quite a while though before they really knew he was missing because he had gone away and told his wife that he had to go to new york on business and might be gone for a week and not to worry if he didn't get home and not to worry if he didn't write because he should be thinking from day to day that he might take the next train home and that there would be no use in writing so the wife waited and she tried not to worry until it was two days over the week and then she ran into a neighbor's and fainted dead away on the floor and then they made inquiries and found out that he had skipped with some money that didn't belong to him too then folks began to ask where was that woman and they had found out by comparing notes that nobody had seen her since the man went away but three or four women remembered that she had told them that she thought of taking the child and going to boston to visit her folks so when they hadn't seen her around and the house shut they jumped to the conclusion that was where she was they were the neighbors that lived right around her but they didn't have much to do with her and she'd gone out of her way to tell them about her boston plan and they didn't make much reply when she did well there was this house shut up and the man and the woman missing and the child then all of a sudden one of the women that lived the nearest remembered something she remembered that she had waked up three nights running thinking she had heard a child crying somewhere and once she waked up her husband but he said it must be the bisbee's little girl and she thought it must be the child wasn't well and was always crying it used to have colic spells especially at night so she didn't think any more about it until this came up then all of a sudden she did think of it she told what she had heard and finally folks began to think that they had better enter the house and see if there was anything wrong well they did enter it and they found that child dead locked in one of the rooms mrs dennison and mrs bird never used that room it was a back bedroom on the second floor yes they found that poor child there starved to death and frozen though they weren't sure she had frozen to death for she was in bed with clothes enough to keep her pretty warm when she was alive but she had been there a week and she was nothing but skin and bone it looked as if the mother had locked her in the house when she went away and told her not to make any noise for fear the neighbors would hear her and find out that she herself had gone mrs dennison said she couldn't really believe that the woman had meant to have her own child starved to death probably she thought the little thing would raise somebody or folks would try to get in the house and find her well whatever she thought there the child was dead but that wasn't all the father came home right in the midst of it the child was just buried and he was beside himself and he went on the track of his wife and he found her and he shot her dead it was all in the papers at the time then he disappeared nothing had been seen of him since mrs dennison said she thought he had either made way with himself or got out of the country nobody knew but they did know that there was something wrong with the house i knew folks acted queer when they asked me how i liked it when we first came says mrs dennison but i never dreamed of why till we saw the child that night i never heard anything like it in my life says mrs emerson staring at the other woman with awestruck eyes i thought you'd say so says mrs meserve you don't wonder that i ain't disposed to speak light when i hear there is anything queer about a house do you no i don't after that mrs emerson said but that ain't all said mrs meserve did you see it again mrs emerson asked yes i saw it a number of times before the last time it was lucky i wasn't nervous or i never could have stayed there much as i liked the place and much as i thought of those two women they were beautiful women and no mistake i love those women i hope mrs dennison will come and see me some time well i stayed and i never knew when i'd see that child i got so i was very careful to bring everything of mine upstairs and not leave any little thing in my room that needed doing for fear she would come lugging up my coat or hat or gloves or i'd find things done when there'd been no live being in the room to do them i can't tell you how i dreaded seeing her and worse than the seeing her was a hearing her say i can't find my mother it was enough to make your blood run cold i never heard a living child cry for its mother that was anything so pitiful as that dead one it was enough to break your heart she used to come and say that to mrs bird oftener than to any one else once i heard mrs bird say she wonder if it was possible that the poor little thing couldn't really find her mother in the other world she had been such a wicked woman 
But Mrs. Dennison told her she didn't think she ought to speak so, nor even think so. Mrs. Bird says she shouldn't wonder if she was right. Mrs. Bird was always very easy to put in the wrong. She was a good woman, and one that couldn't do things enough for other folks. It seems as if that was what she lived on. I don't think she was ever so scared by that poor little ghost as much as she pitied it. She was most heartbroken because she couldn't do anything for it as she could have done for a live child. It seems to me sometimes as if I should die if I can't get that awful little white robe off that child and get her in some clothes and feed her and stop her looking for her mother, I heard her say once, and she was in earnest. She cried when she said it. That wasn't long before she died. Now I am coming to the strangest part of it all. Mrs. Bird died very sudden. One morning, it was Saturday and there wasn't any school, I went downstairs to breakfast and Mrs. Bird wasn't there. There was nobody but Mrs. Dennison. She was pouring out the coffee when I came in. Why, where's Mrs. Bird? says I. Abby ain't feeling very well this morning, says she. There isn't much the matter, I guess, but she didn't sleep very well and her head aches and she's sort of chilly. And I told her I thought she'd better stay in bed till the house gets warm. It was a very cold morning. Maybe she's got a cold, says I. Yeah, I guess she has, says Mrs. Dennison. I guess she's got a cold. She'll be up before long. Abby ain't one to stay in bed a minute longer than she can help. Well, we went on eating our breakfast, and all at once a shadow flickered across one wall of the room and over the ceiling, the way a shadow will sometimes when somebody passes the window outside. Mrs. Dennison and I both looked up, then out of the window. Then Mrs. Dennison, she gives a scream. Why, Abby's crazy, says she. There she is, out this bitter cold morning, and, and... She didn't finish, but she meant the child. For we were both looking out, and we saw, as plain as we ever saw anything in our lives, Mrs. Abby Bird walking off over the white snow path with that child holding fast to her hand, nestling close to her as if she had found her own mother. She's dead, says Mrs. Dennison, clutching hold of me hard. She's dead. My sister is dead. She was. We hurried upstairs as fast as we could go, and she was dead in her bed and smiling as if she was dreaming, and one arm and hand was stretched out as if something had hold of it, and it couldn't be straightened even at the last. It lay out over her casket at the funeral. Was that child ever seen again? asked Mrs. Emerson in a shaking voice. No, replied Mrs. Meserve. That child was never seen again after she went out of the yard with Mrs. Bird. End of section 7. Recording by Claudia. End of The Wind in the Rosebush and Other Stories of the Supernatural by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman.